you ever watch Hi, like uh, obscure cable channels? <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, welcome yeah. to Antiques Roadshow. <laughs> this couch has been appraised at ten dollars. It doesn't matter. Cammy wanted it in the lounge. <laughs> oh. oh, we're live. I like how he does this that afterwards. Yeah, we've been yeah. prattling on that's for a while his, now. That's kind of the thing he does. Okay, yeah. well, just point to me when I should actually start the, you know, talking part. I'm ready to go. Whenever I want to. And whenever you want to. Okay. She always makes me <laughs> get very goofy. Things. He always says he'll edit this part out, and then he, and then he never no, does. And then he edits all the other stuff out. He just uses this part. Okay. Good morning. We're live from Ellis Bridge Day Three, and I'm here with Mayor Sam Adams. I'm Cami Chaos. I forgot that part. I don't know. You guys know that. The You're smart watching yesterday. And lovely Cami Chaos. Oh, thank you. I paid him to say that. No. Um. Uh. You were here giving the keynote this morning. Yeah. Uh, you gave a keynote last year as well. Yes. Do you have a thing for open source? I have a total fascination and uh, enthusiasm for open source. Mm -hmm. I think that the talent that we have here in the Portland area is second to none mm -hmm. uh, on a lot of levels, but especially in the area of open source. We have, yeah, we do have a great pool of open source. Uh, it's the whole open source capital of the world. It is. It is. We Don't are the open me. source city and region of the world. So it makes sense that when it comes to technology and software, that that would be our strength. But it's not just that technology and software are open source in Portland. Uh, your administration has made great strides and tried to make sure that uh, we have more of an open city and that yep. we have a more of an open source uh, platform here. Can you talk That's a right. little bit about that? Well, I, I I think it, my efforts at making Portland much more open source, transparent, real time, mm -hmm. more accountable, uh, builds on, I think, the values and the traditions that this city and region have, have long held. What's held us back from more is sort of the, the barriers of not having the information, the barriers of not having the platforms and the, and the technology necessarily to really take full advantage of this value of transparency and openness that we have as a as a city and a region and so you know based on the feedback that we've gotten from uh, the software industry you know we went to town this past, this past year making our you know the a, a larger set of data points available to the public than any other region in the United States uh, backing that up though with more funding for uh, folks that are doing software development uh, to be able to do their work and then scale it up having the resources to take it to market scale it up. Having the city of Portland be a first customer to help folks work out the bugs, you know, in their initial sort of uh, launch of technology. And then our Portland 10, the sort of where we match not only resources, but then the, the best minds specific to project, you know, the, the actual uh, development. development of projects to match folks up with the best mentors that we can find. Um, I'm really excited. I mean, this is uh, this is the uh, public-private partnership, and it's very grassroots, and it's exactly what I wanted to see happen uh, when I ran for mayor. So I'm I'm really excited. Okay. So let me ask you one more question. It's kind of a chicken or the egg thing. Do you think what what came first? Do you think that Portland kind of became a hub for open source uh, because of the uh, the way of life that we have here, or do you think that uh, Portland's adopted that so much because we had so much talent? I think it's a little of both, but I have to say that it I think it's in our DNA. I mean, you know, this is the place of you know clean government. This is the place of planning, which is fundamentally about you know setting public goals and then reporting on whether you meet them or not. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's very sort of upfront government, very open source kind of government. So I think it builds on our tradition and we get to attract people that have those kinds of values, very talented people, and then they in turn push us in really positive and constructive ways uh, to do more. Then we open up more and they get more ideas and push us more. I think it's this great symbiotic, very positive symbiotic, uh, positive relationship. But fundamentally, you know, it's about the folks uh, behind us. That's where the ideas come from. The best ideas are going to come from, from <laughs> folks like this. Now, at this time of the morning, I've learned that this is not like a morning industry. I, I had a 7.30 breakfast. You had so a 7.30 I'm, breakfast? I'm up. And well, with other people a, who were in the room. A rare exception. You know, I <laughs> started yeah, my remarks rare. by saying I, I, it's okay <laughs> if they nod off, but please don't fall out of your chair. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, it's the talent behind us that drives innovation, and, and our job, my job, is to support that in any way that we possibly can. You're doing can. a good job. Well, thanks. Thank you.
right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I'll let you get about your day. But you betcha. Thank you so much. Thanks for all the work you all do. Bye. Welcome back to OS Bridge, day three. I'm Cami Cass, and we're here with Mark Greinke, CTO, Chief Technology Officer of all of Portland. <laughs> the city of Portland, the fabulous city of Portland. What exactly was Portland thinking when they decided to go all open sourcing? Well, I was uh, lucky enough to have uh, uh, participate in a very uh, interesting conversation with a gentleman who's the former CTO for DC. His name is Vic Kundra, mm -hmm. who actually happens to be the CTO for the Obama administration right now. And mm -hmm. he actually chained, explained to me what they were doing in DC, their original apps for democracy contest. Mm -hmm. And essentially what they've done is what we're replicating here now in Portland, but the difference is we're uh, including uh, government agencies outside the city, so it has Metro, mm -hmm. uh, TriMet, the quasi governmental agencies, yeah, Portland Public Schools, yeah. and I think the, the realization that I came to was, you know, we collect all this data on behalf of the, the taxpayers, the citizens, mm -hmm. the public here, the businesses, mm -hmm. and this data has uh, it's it's proprietary. It's kept inside the city, and we make decisions based on it. Mm -hmm. But it has value outside of that. Mm -hmm. right? and citizens can use that information to do some pretty amazing things. You look at the applications that can be done with mashups of TriMet information, streetcar information, mm -hmm. uh, parks, and there's there's an economic development value because people can use this information to, to develop some really innovative applications. But they can also use it to basically understand their, their government and their city better and, and help be more informed about what decisions they want their electeds to make. Uh, and I think that's something that makes Portland pretty unique is that not only is it offered, but it's something that the citizens really, uh, I mean, on a base level, in a lot of places you have people who are involved and people who are uninvolved, but uninvolved people in Portland are kind of a rarity. Everybody, no matter what sector of, of uh, you know of business or society they're in, seem to want to have a hand in what Portland does and what Portland is. Well, the word open is in our DNA. I yeah. mean, you can think about it. I mean, we have uh, an open, participative uh, uh, citizenry. We have an open source community. You know, open data is a perfect fit for that. I mean, it's really in our, our in our DNA. And you've even seen this in you know our our push for Google and the insurance please, of... Please, Google, uh, please. <laughs> I've asked you before. Uh, I'm sure he's asked Open nicely. access is, again, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's in our DNA. Yeah. So tell me, what exactly does a CTO do? Because I don't imagine that you're, you know, elbow deep in code every day. Well, you know, <laughs> I like to try to, you know, still get in there every once in a while. Do it. The reality is the CTO's goal is to basically, and my goal at the city, is using technology for two things. To one, allow the government to make more, to, to work more effectively, but two, allow mm -hmm. citizens to interact with government more effectively. Mm -hmm. So, you know, day to day, you know, we're, 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 you know, it's everything from, hey, how does, how do we use data from our 911 call system to, 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 to use the analytics to determine how can I, we respond to those calls faster to, hey, what am I doing to stop the amount of spam that's coming into the environment? Or, or you know, how can we make uh, the procurement process easier for uh, local small businesses to, mm -hmm. to, to work with? Mm -hmm. So you're the overlord of all the, of all the little, do you, know, do you even like it when I use evil diabolical terms like overlord? It just, it's not helpful in interviewing often. Uh, you're the overseer of everything that, that collects. Basically, we manage all the technology for the city government, yes. with very few exceptions. But it's everything from the system that does your you know, responding to 911 calls, mm -hmm. the law enforcement, the fire records management, the sewer, the the all the pay parking meters, all that data comes through the city of Portland and we do our own uh, credit card processing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really everything that you can think a city government does and how do you automate that? That's what I'm responsible for. And I, I really came from the ground up from the, from the troops. So uh, I have a really good understanding of what the hands-on needs are, but I also came from the private industry and understanding that we're a service provider. Yeah. And that's our, that's our number one goal is to serve our customers, particularly the, the citizens. 
um, are you doing anything? So you, you came in to see uh, the mayor give his keynote, or are you attending the conference? Uh, I've been in and out of the conference based on what I've got going on with my schedule site. Was at some of the birds of a feather uh, uh, items that we had in the evening, and we had an open gov, open data uh, panel discussion that was on. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Very. Well, Mark, I really appreciate you taking the time to join Absolutely us. Absolutely a pleasure. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. profit companies can do a better job of upstreaming their patches to open source projects. Mm -hmm. And then there was a lightning talk that I gave about an anthology called Thought Crime Experiments. So I want to ask you about the for-profit uh, companies uh, merging their patches because I think open source is kind of underused in for-profit companies. I mean, mm -hmm. it's an easy solution for a nonprofit because right. if you can find uh, the technological help to implement it, it's an easy solution because you're not worrying about uh, the licensing issues and you're not worrying about the, the cost involved for the most part. It's a lot uh, easier for you to find a way to maintain, but for-profit companies tend to shy away from it in some ways, in some ways not, right? I mean, for-profit companies, like anybody else, like nonprofits, try to use the best tool for the job. And right. so many, so much of the time, the best tool for the job is something that's basically best in class, like WordPress or Apache go or something WordPress. like that. Go WordPress? Are you a big I'm WordPress, a WordPress fan? Girl, yeah. Well, you know, and there's a good reason for that, right? It has a terrific ecology, mm -hmm. and every real ecology, every really strong set of stacks in an industry or in a sub-industry has open and proprietary bits in it. Yeah. I mean, there's some that are just open, but you're not going to find anything that's incredibly awesome where there's only proprietary bits. There's always a mix. Mm -hmm. And one thing about that is a strong ecology requires that there be people thinking pragmatically about keeping a usable upstream. Mm -hmm. Because if you just grab a code dump from somewhere, like let's say you're building on top of GTK because you know you're a device manufacturer and you take you just take GNOME mm -hmm. and then you just mod it endlessly so that it suits whatever your needs of the moment are then you're stuck, you've forked, yeah. and you're just pointlessly causing more trouble for yourself in the long run because at some point you're going to want some of the fixes that have happened or some new features. But the fixes are going to break what you've done. Exactly. Yeah. So if you take a little bit more time in the beginning, or I should say along the way, mm -hmm. to do some good engineering mm -hmm. and take care with your total cost of ownership, then you know, you'll know you be happier in the long run. What this means is merging stuff upstream. Yeah. And that does take a little bit of extra time in terms of actually collaborating with the community, writing those unit tests, generalizing your fixes, but honestly, wouldn't you want to be doing that anyway if it were, for example, a large company where you were taking a snapshot of some trunk code to make a little tool for yourself or something like that? Yeah. You know, I mean, whether you're collaborating with open source or you are just making a change to some code that you wrote yourself, mm -hmm. you know, you still have to follow good engineering practices, yeah. and one of those is merging stuff up. Now, all my notes from the talk are online at the Open Source Bridge Wiki, but I'll just say briefly that uh, I told some stories mm -hmm. about fails, <laughs> really big People fails. People like the fail stories Dude, better than they like the success stories. They do. I mean, you know. Well, I told some fail stories, but I also went into a few moments of success. Like mm -hmm. Yahoo mm -hmm. has a, a committee, which is basically the one-stop shop for an engineer who wants to go and say, hey, I want to either open source this project entirely or I have some code that I want to contribute back yeah. to an existing project. And so this committee started off very fail because it was just lawyers and they would go endlessly through rounds with you and nothing happened. Mm -hmm. But now it's iterated to a point where it's a much quicker process. There's lawyers and engineers on this committee and therefore everyone can understand together, all right, pragmatically, what does this mean? How much time is this going to take? What is the actual legal ramification of this? What is the business ramification of this? Are we going to enhance our business interests? Are our business interests going to be sort of neutral and non-affected? Or is there any actual negative effect mm -hmm. on our business interests from upstreaming or uh, open sourcing this code? And I talked to JJ, uh, John Javed, uh -huh. uh, uh, who is currently of eBay, but who used to be of Yahoo, and he said that it basically is now a pretty good process. So obviously, like so many things, you know, you prototype it and then you iterate it. Yeah. And so I did say that story a little bit, but I also told a couple stories of fails, and I talked about sort of the four major categories of obstacles that for-profit companies face when they want to upstream some new code, when, when an individual engineer usually wants to upstream some code. What are those four code. bullet points? Could it be that you want me to go through the thing that I said I was going to go through? 
<laughs> um, we just had mic fail. Oh no! It was lovely. It's not so, the mics we're using, so it's all but, good. But I, I appreciate like the the practiced segue. Um, <laughs> boom! Yeah. Wait. No. So what are the Wait, four I just ruined the sprezzatura of the it's whole okay. thing. Sorry. It's all right. I I like the I like the. You sure. Know, I, it's cool. And um, so one of them is legal. Mm -hmm. Just the legal stuff of people not being sure what process to go through. Mm -hmm. um, another thing is external to the company. It's basically the individual projects sometimes have strange or non-existent community management mm -hmm. and therefore don't really interface well with contributors as a whole, including contributors at for-profit companies. Um, and there's copyright assignment issues sometimes, like if you're the FSF and you require, as I understand it, that people not just license the code to you, but give you copyright mm. when they contribute code, yep. that's going to be a little bit more difficult to get. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's something that I didn't stress too heavily because, you know what, those are other talks. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so I've talked a little bit about legal, I've talked about the external floss issues, mm -hmm. and then there's the sort of floss culture at the company. Mm -hmm. You know, I gave a story of a company where technically they, I mean, they had open sourced a project, but they just thrown it over the wall, and they weren't really thinking internally of it as a project where they should be including the community in their improvements and the contest to improve the, pro the product, yeah. stuff like that. So developing a floss culture, I gave some ideas on that and then uh, you know in the short and long term there's time in project management because it takes a little bit more time to do it right so how do you get that time I gave some tips for how you could advocate for that or how you could schedule it in and how to make that decision of hmm you know, here are some checklists of things to think about when trying to figure out whether taking the extra time to open source this or to contribute it upstream enhances the company's or the project's interest in the short or the medium or the long run. Mm -hmm. You can usually, I mean, the reason why you want to do it. In the short run, not so much. In the short run, boom, you get it done, but it's later on that it becomes uh, Arguably, beneficial. yeah. I mean, there could be situations where it's the short run feasible, but you're right. Usually in the absolute short run, it's a little bit easier to do the work around. But certainly, in uh, it could be that this will enhance the quality of your product in the long run. It could be that this will make it easier to add new features. It may mm -hmm. be that in the long run, it will save your company time and money. You know, so I have sort of a checklist there. Obviously, if you go through these checklists and you can, all you can think is, huh, the only reason I want to upstream this is I ideology and sort of a completist passion for nitpicking, mm -hmm. you know, maybe you won't be able to sell that to your company, but most of the time you can find some way to help your manager understand why you're doing something. But even better than that, if you can get some buy-in from someone way high up who can, you know, butt heads with legal counsel if necessary, yeah. and that person basically says, sure, I have your back, go ahead and do it. Yeah. Especially if you're an engineer who's already on schedule, you know, you're already getting everything else done on time. You know, sometimes yeah. that kind of low-key approach also works. So I think I hope that I demonstrated a range of how you can approach the issue. Um, and there was a good conversation that got started there, and I hope it continues, mm -hmm. you know, today in the unconference, in the hallways, and online. Well, tomorrow will be the unconference, and, and I'll be interested to see if anything comes about. I want to switch uh, modes really quick. Sure. Uh, you're the first person. Last year uh, at OS Bridge, when I was doing interviews, one of the big things was the, the geek feminism and women in tech. It Sweet. Was, it was huge last year, and I think part of that was because it was the first year of OS Bridge, and the founders are both women. Well, what, what time of year was it? Was it this time Same of year? Same time of year. Well, then it was all also, um, you know, last year, right at OS Bridge, you know, it was, you know, I think last year was a big year in terms of people become, coming to realize issues around women in tech. Mm -hmm. um, and it was right after, I mean, probably the same things were stirring in the water and in the air that led my, call, my I should say my friend, my colleague on Geek Feminism, Kiralee Robert, mm -hmm. to give her talk standing out in the crowd at OSCON. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you really see... Is it see the unicorn talk? It wasn't. No. It wasn't the unicorn talk. Um, well, do they know what they? Do you think they know what we mean? Well, we had a long discussion about it last year. Go back and watch my uh, interview with Maria from last year at Osbridge. Uh huh. She defined it very nicely for us. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Go, just go, we'll link it or something. There'll right. be a link when I this gets posted. I can't help you if you're live. Just, you know. Now, you know what you should do. Um, you should also advise them if there's any open source plugins that they mm -hmm. could add to VLC to make us look like we have unicorn horns. Sparkle Pony. Also, did you know that Portland was built on a unicorn burial ground? Just... Is there also gullible written on the ceiling? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, that's one of the popular mythologies of Portland. 
Okay. That's what the geeks like to say. In Portland, no, I'm not. I'm not actually didn't. It sounds like I made that up. It really does. It sounds like I made that up, but I actually. Did Is this not make improv? That up. Should I be yes and? I here? did not make this up. Just go out. And also, we've got Marshall Kirkpatrick, and he is like hugely obsessed with unicorns. And he's um, in Portland. I am unaware of this alleged unicorn burial you, ground. Yeah, no, you need to just yeah, just Google it. Well, I could Google it. Mm. I could also Google conspiracy theories that say well made of lizards. <laughs> That's true. So, Good. you Something know. Something will come up either way. I'm fairly certain it will. But, <laughs> speaking of unicorns, <laughs> there are no unicorns here. Actually, no, there's racial unicorns because it's a pretty bad group in terms of racial and ethnic yes. diversity. Um, but. It's Portland. Well. Portland is very white. I. I have only been to Portland a little bit, mm -hmm. um, and I have gotten a little bit of that impression. It's, it's super white. But since this is a regional conference, and it is drawing some people from the Bay Area and Seattle as well, yeah. you know, I was kind of hoping. Honestly, also, you know, to be frank, even in tech conferences where there's a lot of white people, often there's additionally, you know, some proportion of Asian Americans. No, not so much. Well. Not, not. Well, let's hope that that's something we can uh, work on next year. Yeah. All right. right. Okay. So we've got we've got the more women. Now we need a more diverse cultural experience. People. Absolutely, because right. you know when you think about issues like accessibility and marketing, we do have a woman here that covers take accessibility. Over the world? Oh, that's Where's great. Where's Callie? You should meet Callie. I work a bit with the GNOME project, the mm -hmm. GNOME desktop environment. Mm -hmm. um, do you want me to explain to them what it is? No, I think we have someone else coming on in a few minutes. Oh, great. But. Sure, Maybe but anyway, you know. GNOME cares a lot about accessibility, <laughs> and so that's yeah. one of the ways that I've made that link in my own head of, you know, it matters what we do. Yeah. Yeah. It matters what we do to reach out because otherwise, how are we going to take over the world if we can't help take care of everybody? We have to take care of the world very carefully, one step at a time. Thank you so much. It was so nice to meet you. You Thanks too, for coming on. Sure, and have a great time. Hi, welcome back to OS Bridge Day 3. I'm Cami Chaos, and we're here with Skip Newberry, who's the, I'm going to read it, Economic Development Policy Advisor. If it was three words, I would be able to hold it in my head. How are you doing, Skip? I'm doing well. How about you? I'm doing good. What are you doing here today? Um, I'm here. Uh, I started off with the mayor mm -hmm. uh, as he was delivering his, uh, his keynote address this morning, mm -hmm. and um, now I'm talking to some of the, uh, the folks that are involved with the Civic Apps Project. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been working on that for about the past year with uh, the likes of TriMed and Metro, and we have representatives from both organizations here today. Um, we're really excited about the, uh, the Civic Apps Hack Fest that's going on as part of OS Bridge this afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, the mayor in particular is very excited to, uh, to see what comes out of that session. And um, yeah, it's, it's a great event. Um, OS Bridge is really uh, you know, taking off. And I was here last night as well as part of a, a civic engagement meetup. Mm -hmm. uh, we had folks from the Portland Development Commission as well talking about the PDC. The For PDC. those of you who've been paying attention. Talking about how the community uh, here in Portland can get engaged with the public sector, um, making ourselves accessible and approachable, and talking about the issues of the day. So what is it that you guys expect to come out of the apps? Uh, out of the apps, we hope to do a couple of things. On a large scale, we hope to make government more efficient, more transparent. Mm -hmm. We're trying to uh, involve people um, more closely with uh, the inner workings of government mm -hmm. so that they know what kind of data sets we actually maintain on a daily basis. And there's real value there. Um, the other part of the educational process is educating government staffers on the fact that there's real value in the data sets and that there's a real service to be delivered to the public and making them public. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, uh, we're also getting feedback from some people uh, in Portland saying, yeah, the data sets you launched are great, let's see about X, Y, and Z as well. Yeah. Um, so we hope to add additional data sets as we move forward. So the more you guys start out with, the more people go, wait, but this is cool too, this would be fantastic. Exactly. Uh, is more, I mean, does that come out of something like this when everyone gets together and starts to sit down and look what there really is? Yep. Yeah, I think a lot of the, uh, the great ideas have come out of informal gatherings, um, meetups. Uh, we had an idea meetup uh, last week. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a number of people um, who were here at the conference uh, in attendance. and. Um, 
some of the things that came out of that were like the the Portland API that was discussed earlier here yeah. today. Great idea. Um, you know the the concept of um, you know allowing people with their uh, mobile devices to um, actually post an idea to the Civic Apps website mm -hmm. is something we should have thought of originally. But once again, you know, great idea uh, came from the public and is likely to be adopted at some point in the near future. Well, the government is supposed to be of the people, so it, exactly. I mean, the more stuff is coming from the public, the more we feel like we're involved, which is a good yep. thing. Exactly, and I think that um, here in Portland, we have just an amazing, um, amazingly high level of public engagement. Um, yeah. Of all the cities I've lived in and in, in the country, uh, Portland is unparalleled in that regard. And sometimes it makes governing a little more difficult, a little more cumbersome. You have to jump through it's some like, more hoops. It's like ruling a bunch of headstrong children. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but then with things like civic apps, it's like, wow, this is what's you know possible when you tap into all this positive energy around mm -hmm. people wanting to get involved in government and share mm -hmm. their ideas. Mm -hmm. So where do you think it's the, you know, uh, do you, I asked the mayor something similar, but it's the chicken or the egg. Uh, did Portland being so open draw this community in here? I mean, we have a fantastic right. open source community, not just uh, in, in terms of uh, technology, but in terms of uh, lifestyle mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and community as well. Yep. Do you think that people are drawn here because of that, or do you think that it's just what our citizens make the city? Um, you know, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, you know, people, I think part of it was an organic process process where you know people looked at Portland and its quality of life and said I want to live there and um, you know I might have some great ideas for a company or a project but you know if I can do it in Portland that's kind of the best of both worlds yeah. um, I think professionally we've got a reputation as being a very collaborative um, place we certainly we do. Uh, very it's very um, open and accessible and welcoming um, I'm a case in point I moved here uh, five years ago from the East Coast uh, was involved with a couple of startups mm -hmm. and um, had the option option of living in a couple of different cities. I chose Portland partly out of professional reasons. It was mm -hmm. easy to connect with um, independent contractors to work on our projects and they were incredibly talented. Yeah. Um, the other part of it was, you know, I had my wife here, um, quality of life was fantastic and, you know, of all the places that I could have lived, Portland was easily uh, the number one choice. All right. Well, Skip, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Thank you Thank so you. much. It's good to see you again. Great to see you too. All right. Thanks. Welcome back to OS Bridge. I'm Cami Chaos, and I'm here after lunch on day three with Peter Kroneski. And uh, we asked you to come by for one very specific reason, but you might have other things to talk about. You uh, created the Android app, the schedule app. That's right. All on you, no one said, hey, Peter, we need an Android app. You just were like, oh, crap, they need a schedule. Yeah, just one of those things. I was uh, sitting there one night and thought, hey, that would be really cool. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I poked around on the website. I, I didn't talk to anyone at OS Bridge. I just poked around the website, saw, you know, that they had the ability to give me the data. So that is an API or something? Uh, well, originally, API -ish. yeah, originally they just had a iCal file, okay. which is, you know, a, a data file with a calendar in it. Mm -hmm. And so I pulled that down and made a little demo and said, hey, look at this. Uh, do you like it? And, and Selena was extremely excited about it. So mm -hmm. uh, They like calendar stuff here. Yeah. They really do. That's not a joke, they do. Audrey does Caligate, whatever. You people on the camera, I don't know what to do with you. Sorry, yeah. they're rude, it's okay. You go ahead. Yeah, so, so anyhow, <laughs> yeah, um, connected me up with Egal and the other people who are doing the website, gave mm -hmm. me a more complete data feed and mm -hmm. I just tacked away furiously to get it done. So how long, when did you, when did you decide it needed to happen and when, when was it done? Last Tuesday, I started about 7 p.m. at night, mm -hmm. and it was in the App Store, I think, uh, midday Thursday. So that's one of the big differences between uh, the Android App Store and, say, the iPhone App Store, is that you can get something created and in, in, into the App Store very quickly. Right, and I actually didn't realize that because this is I've I've worked on another app, but it's not published in the store yet, mm -hmm. and I didn't know what the lag time was, and so I mean I knew the conference wasn't that far away, and I, I thought that you know at least had to have some minimal approval. Mm -hmm. No, I I posted it, and within seconds it was available. For it was just to boom. Download. Okay, there you go. Have it. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. That is very awesome. That's a very you know it's a very open. I, I am surprised though. I mean it, the, the Android app makes a lot of sense, but I am surprised. I'm an iPhone user. I'll fess up to it, but I'm amazed at an open source conference. Uh, 
how, how few Android phones I see in comparison to how many iPhones there are laying around. I have a confession. You're an iPhone user as well? I'm an iPhone user. I, I do have an actual Android device, but mm -hmm. it's mostly just for fun. Ah, uh, see? So. Dirty secrets. Why didn't you make me an iPhone app? I could have used it. The talk I wanted well, to see got rescheduled. If I had, it would still probably be I in know, the... It would be pending. It would be pending. Yeah. You could let me test it, but you didn't know me. It's all right. Um, so you're you're uh, you're on on Twitter at Kreneski P K R E N E S K Y P, and uh, tell us about your website osuosl.org. Yeah, so that's actually the the website for my employer, the OSU Open Source Lab, mm -hmm. um, and you know we do a variety of stuff. Uh, people know us for hosting. Um, things like Drupal, uh, masterkernel.org, mm -hmm. and a bunch of other uh, open source projects. Mm -hmm. We also do software development for open source projects, like Android apps and, and other cool stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also do a little bit of uh, government outreach. Um, now, are you here at OS Bridge for your employer or for your own curious fulfillment? Uh, both. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the open source lab is sort of like one of those dream jobs where, mm -hmm. you know, you get to do what you, you really like as well. Yeah. Um, you know, so like the Android app, that started all in my spare time. Um, you know, I did get to spend some work time, you know, finishing it up. Mm -hmm. But it was something that initially was all, all my own time. And, you know, and there's plenty of other projects of mine that have, that have all started that way as well. So, side, I mean, this is the very basic side project. It's not like this is something, I mean, you're not going to create an ongoing, you're not going to be like, oh my god, we need a really, really sustainable Android scheduling app. Let's do it right now. This was just a one-off kind of thing that you're like, this is what I want. Um, you know, that was actually how it started. Oh, really? And, okay. you know, several people have approached me now and they're like, oh, you know, we're using open, open conferenceware for our conference too. Mm -hmm. uh, what, can we make this work? And, you know, so I, I think we will because Very nice. it, yeah, it, it really helps uh, attendees at a conference and um, it's it, really nice to be able to keep track of things uh, without a piece of paper that you're going to drop. You're never going to lose your phone, hopefully. Hopefully not. Um, and, and you know, the great thing about uh, open source bridges, there are other people who like to write open source software and you know initially it was just me mm -hmm. now there's other people helping mm -hmm. um, so it's it's not like it's just me writing this big app now yeah um, you know you never have to go it alone with open source which is great all right well if people want to find you where they, where can they find you on twitter and on the web uh, Koneski P at Twitter and um, osuosl.org is uh, the Open Source Lab website, um, and my email is peter at osuosl.org. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. I'm noticing that he didn't. Oh, there's the point. Thank you, Cody. Hey, I'm Camia Cass. Welcome back to OS Bridge D3. We're here with one of the founders, Audrey Eshright and a very, very special guest. Say hello to Creepius. <laughs> oh my gosh, Creepius, you're the cutest little bear ever, aren't you? I see that you don't have red embroidery floss for teeth, but you do have something. <laughs> where, where, Audrey, I'm yes. talking to a puppet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, you're so cute, look at your little ears. Where, where did Creepius come from, Audrey? <laughs> So I'm doing a talk called The Fine Line Between Creepy and Fun. Uh -huh. And in the course of uh, working up material for this, I decided that Facebook had sort of a creepy teddy bear aspect to it. Yes. And so I drew that. And then um, at some point, that seemed to need a hand puppet. Yes. So there we go. Lots of things need hand puppets. They do. Most of all, Facebook creepy aspects. So uh, Creepiest, you have your own Twitter account. Yes. As of about five seconds ago. Hopefully, if Reed did what we <laughs> what we told him to do. So you can follow Creepius at, at Creepius yeah. uh, on Twitter. You can follow Audrey at, at Spinnerin. Mm -hmm. uh, Audrey, tell us how how's it going? This is year two of mm -hmm. OS Bridge. Mm -hmm. How's it going? I don't know. It seems to be going really well. I yeah. actually, um, after being so involved in all the organizing planning last year, I'm just a volunteer this time and mm -hmm. a speaker, and uh, that's pretty awesome too. Mm -hmm. And I'm having a really good time. Do you like this venue? I noticed that you weren't. You didn't this look nice. Stressed. You didn't. You didn't have the. You know. I don't, yeah, no, I don't look nearly as frazzled as somebody who was actually planning a conference would. Selena looks yeah. really mellow, too, though. Yeah, she yeah. must be getting some sleep, like, yeah. sneaking in Well, somewhere. she's working now, but yeah. early, like, on the yeah. first day, I was like, Selena, you look surprisingly calm. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got your talk. 
Yep, everything's going well. How yep. are we feeling about the venue? I like the venue. It's yeah. nice. It's uh, really cushy carpets. Yes. You know, no Which more concrete. Even more important if you're wearing heels or <laughs> yeah, really anything. big shoes. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> I have nothing to do with the carpeting, but <laughs> I'm just saying. Thanks. I, yeah, no, I like the carpet. I like it too. Yeah. So mm -hmm. overall, I mean, we've got four, we, four days both years. Uh, no. Or am I wrong? Was it three Didn't days we, last year? I think year? we did three and then four this year. Okay. So we got an extra day. three days of scheduling, one day. Yeah, maybe of, the of same number of talks, but spread out a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Because last year people felt like there were just too many competing things at the same time for them to get to what they really most wanted to go to. So it's a little bit more spread out. There's still a lot of overlap. Um, amusingly, I am actually talking at the same time as the Facebook operations team. And so we will not be able to hear what each other tsk, has tsk, to tsk. say. But my talk's not just about Facebook. It's actually about uh, creepy situations across social software and how developers can control whether people are having fun or having creepy things happen. So give me an example of a creepy situation across social software. Well, one of the Aside from this adorable little problems puppet. is that uh, when you're posting messages publicly and you can uh, be friended by somebody and not have to approve them back, oh. that you can have people that maybe you don't get along with so well. And you could block them. But it's like Twitter. Yeah, like yeah. Twitter. You know, you, you might block them, but it might be your boss and you feel kind of awkward about that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're not sure whether they're actually paying attention to everything because they don't reply to you, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, that can be a pretty creepy thing for people. Yeah, it can be. Or in Foursquare, um, you know, sometimes you check into a venue and you think only your friends are paying attention. But I've uh, talked to people who say, well, my ex keeps showing up. And <laughs> Foursquare is the one you know. venue where I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm like, there are days that I'm kind of carefree, but there are days that I'm I don't know you. You can't follow me. Yeah. No. no. I mean, on Foursquare, if I don't know you and I haven't, like, sat down in person and had a drink with you, I'm probably yeah. not adding you. Yeah, because, it, like, there are days that I'm, when, when we were in Austin, I was more <laughs> amenable to people following me. Oh, yeah, because you had all the extra. Because it was like, oh, we're, know, in for the conference we're doing and stuff. It's fun, fun, fun. If they're a Portland this. person, then you figure Correct. we're all out of town together. Correct. Correct. But then you get home and you're like, crap, these are all these people I don't know. Mm -hmm. And you're following me on Foursquare and now you know my every move. Yeah. And I that mean, is creepy. My kind of every move. He likes that. I know a lot. you do. You know? Yes, you do. So that's, I think that's Creepy Bear's goal is just to encourage creepy behavior. Yeah. You know, by finding all those little places in the software where, oh, look, I can do this now. And yeah. Yeah. He gets so excited. So if that was his mission statement, it would be... You know, to be <laughs> to creepy where the creepiness. no one has been creepy yes. before. To expose the creepiness inherent in social software. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Well, uh, it's, a, it's a hell of a look you've got going there, creepiest. <laughs> yeah. All right, Audrey, I'm going to let you get ready for your talk. Mm -hmm. but thank you so much for joining us. Thank and you. Thank you so much for bringing creepiest on. Thanks. Right. Bye, guys. <laughs>
the culture yeah. of uh, Portland and you know the community here. So, speaking of, how did you get in involved in open source? Um, and how long? This is just question. <laughs> let's just ask a question straight off of the the sign up, the uh, the uh, registration. How long have you been involved in open source? Uh, I think it's been. I'm trying to remember now. It's been about seven or eight years. Yeah. I uh, got involved around 2003. Mm -hmm. um, I dabbled with Linux a little bit before, but it wasn't until 2003 when I was using Gentoo on my machine and I was hanging out on IRC and the server channel and uh, I was helping people out when I could because yeah. I was <clears throat> you know, had a lot of extra time back then mm -hmm. and uh, eventually one of the people Gentoo developers hey, said, "Hey, we need some help on our team. You want to join?" I'm like, "Heck yeah!" Yeah. And so that's how I got involved. I got involved in the infrastructure side. Uh, didn't do much of actual coding or anything, and eventually I got involved in some coding. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not really a, a developer, but I know enough to be dangerous, so... <laughs> <laughs> That's the best place to be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah? <laughs> so, have you been here all three days so far? Yeah. Yeah, and what what was your what has been the most educational talk for you? Maybe something that you uh, saw that you didn't already know about? Uh, I have to remember. <laughs> Every the last two days have been a blur. Yeah, <laughs> most conferences are that way. Um, yeah, I can't think of one. Uh, I have to go through all the ones I was thinking of. Um, yeah, I can't think. It's okay. Um, where your talk is the last session today? What time does it start? Four forty-five. Four forty-five. And where is it? Which room? Uh, I think Fremont. Fremont. I was yeah. up in the Fremont room earlier. All yeah. right. Well, I hope you have a really great talk. Thank thanks. you so much for coming by and talking oh, to thanks. me. Thanks. All right. Thanks for having minutes. me. You can open. Are you recording? Oh, uh, we're been... Hi, welcome to OS Bridge. I'm Cami Chaos, and we're doing a commercial for <gasps> the Startup Crawl. And we have a plan. For a limited time only, I stumbled that one. For a limited time only, you can join us on the Startup Crawl tonight at 6. And for by a limited time, we mean all the way until 11 p.m., where we'll end up on the rooftop deck of Wyden and Kennedy. Mm hmm. And how? And there'll be beer provided by Top Lister. Yay! And Marshall will be there! I sure will. I can't wait. I'm so excited. <laughs> I, uh, I'm really looking forward to it. And we'll all be there together. Well, so you should come too. Yes, you should come too. To Kells. And then to Jan Rain at Puppet Labs and Ermin Airship. Even though it's actually going to be in pie because they're too lazy to carry the keg upstairs. That's true. But there will be a keg upstairs. No, I heard that the keg will up Because of Top Lister! But no, but the Ermin Airship keg is going to be in pie. Oh, well. Yeah. Yeah. So they don't come. have an airship for their keg? No. Isn't that sad? Urban airship. I find you sorely disappointing, but you rock anyway. Apparently they actually have a blimp that flies around the office, not an airship. Isn't a blimp a kind of airship? No. So Michael Richardson, M MT Richardson, will get on you about that because a blimp doesn't actually have a solid structure. Ah. An airship has like a solid internal structure. All right. I will never call a blimp an airship again, MT. I promise. If you guys go to the startup crawl tonight, Beer provided by Tablister. Ching! Dot com. Hi, welcome back to OS Bridge. I'm Cami Cass. This is day three. It's getting treacherously close to the end of day three, though, and I think we might all be ready for nap time. Instead of nap time, though, we're going to talk to Dr. Normal Mike Gebhardt. Hi, Mike. Hi. How are you? I'm doing okay. How are you doing? <laughs> And your name is Cam Cammy? <laughs> Did I get that right? Hi. Okay. I don't know. I, I might work with him a little or right. something. Hey, so you gave a talk earlier a couple hours ago. I did. About the open source con uh, uh, distribution of content for 30 hour day. That's right. It's about, uh, about 30 hour day. About, mm -hmm. Now, I gave this talk on 30 hour day because no one else from the team on 30 hour day gave a talk on 30 hour day so I figured well we had to submit something so apparently the other the, the two creators of 30 hour day are not as driven as the executive producers a little, 30 hour day a little too preoccupied to submit a talk to OS Bridge anyway so they accepted the talk uh, we talked about producing the first 30 hour day mm -hmm. from my standpoint as a producer all the interesting things that we found out speaking of which Cody are we recording right now Okay. <laughs> we, we discussed that you should always check to make sure you're recording. Um, and then kind of a, the larger issue around 30 hour day, the idea that when, as you know, when we launched 30 hour day, 
we talked about use our content, mm -hmm. take our content. So embed the 30-hour day in your websites, pick charities in your local community, and mm -hmm. use the 30-hour day event to raise money there. And I think that as we continue to iterate, like constant iteration that they do in open source with source code, we can constantly iterate 30-hour day, the concept of 30-hour day, for greater impact. Mm -hmm. So if we can somehow, and, and you only know this by doing, right? Correct. We, it's not something that we could predict. We couldn't be like, well, this is what's going to happen. We needed to have that information. We had to, we had to have a dry run. And we need to continue to do it. Yeah. Like we're going to do it again, July 2nd and 3rd. Correct. Um, 30hourday.org. So for more it, information, in case you were curious. 30hourday.org. Not, correct. yeah, we don't pay attention to slides here. So I think that that's, there's, a, there's a larger concept that will play out over time. And it's not necessarily 30-hour day. 30-hour day is an example of something that can, could evolve yeah. to this. But there's a certain open source way and a certain open source culture and a way in which open source developers deal with community and work on problems together across mm -hmm. geographies, yet still in their own local communities. And we could probably solve a lot of the wor world's larger ills if we adopt more of this type of thinking to yeah. our problems. All right. So when you're not working on 30-hour day stuff, you have another show that you're, a new show. Oh. Or a reborn show, Which actually. Show? <laughs> your show. How many shows? No, your show. Uh, my show. Your show. I have a podcast called Crazy Talk. Crazy is, talk. That's right. That's kind of. It's just an hour crazy. long ish. An hour ish long show on Interview Sunday show. nights at nine o'clock. Sunday nights yeah. at nine o'clock. Um, Where could they find that on those internets? Uh, you can find it at drnormal.com. And where could they find you on the Twitters? drnormal.com at drnormal.com. Dr. Normal. Yeah. And Do then Strange Love Live. Yes. Uh, which is going to. We have some big things have planned a, It'll for have a little bit of a metamorphosis soon. After 30-hour day. After 30-hour day. Um, and Meme PDX. And Meme PDX. And OS Bridge. And Web Visions. We do lots of stuff. We do lots of stuff. We do events and we do shows. Uh, yeah. The first uh, bits of Web Visions have already gone up on the yeah. net. That was just like a week. At, I don't know. It's, no. It was like the week before last. So the it Merlin Mann's then. keynote is up there. Your interview with Luke Williams is, is up there. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, the community startups panel. So yeah. a lot of cool stuff. What else? I don't know. Is there anything else you want to tell the boys and girls? I mean, I've already done a commercial for the startup call, so I don't think we have to uh, do that. I would tell the boys and girls, don't do drugs. Don't do drugs. Stay in school. Stay in school. Something. How about you? Any other advice you have? Um... Nap time is wasted on kindergartners. Very good. All you right. having a good time? Yes. Good. I'm having a sleepy time. Is it time for you to interview me? Uh, sure, yeah. Okay. We can do that. Do you Welcome want to switch to places? Uh, or do I, you not have a seating specification that you do for your show? No, because I'm behind a desk. Okay. And usually, usually the interviewees are, uh, are on Skype. I'm more comfortable if we switch. Oh, okay. Okay. Just yeah. Look at that. I can't, because I'll just ask you, just, yeah, there you go. Okay, and I don't even know if we're in the shot anymore. Cody's going to have to... So we have Cody, who's our, uh, started as an intern. He's not really an intern very, anymore. He pushes no, buttons he's, really well he's now. he's producing now, so yeah. very exciting. He's got up to speed very quickly. Hmm. Hopefully he'll be with us 30-hour day. So we have we Cody, go. we have Morgan, we have Kim Gell. Who's Kimberly. Also, yep. Kimberly. So, uh, what's the most exciting thing that's happened to you here at Open Source Bridge? Who have you interviewed? Interesting people. I've, in I've interviewed a lot of interesting people. And, you know, someone asked me this question the first day that I was doing interviews. And I, I had a really great answer. I'm going to say the most interesting person I've interviewed has been you because you're on camera now. Re oh, very nice. Very nice. Yes. Thank you. So. But at the time I answered it last time, it was Scott Deckelman. Scott Deckelman. Yeah. Because he asked me that question, so yeah. I answered. Yeah. I caught a little of the Scott Deckelman talk. It was yeah. interesting about education and open yes, source. Yes, he's an right? educator. 
excellent. Yes, yeah, not so much open source education as my wife is super open source and I'm an educator. Well, this morning you interviewed uh, Mayor Sam Adams again. I did. Yeah. Uh, that would be the second time you interviewed him during 30 Hour Day. Yes. Very gracious, very gracious interviewee. Yes. He seems to be like to he be also, interviewed by you. He, yes, he does. He also seems to like to interview. This time he didn't get a chance to interview me, but last time I think half of our interview was actually him interviewing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're here at a beautiful venue. This is the absolutely... It's the Mark Building of the Portland Art Museum. You've got columns and This is art. their main floor or their the sunken ballroom. The Hacker Lounge is actually... Yeah, what's going on back here? What are these people doing? Uh, afternoon tea. Afternoon tea. A lot of people with laptops open. Yeah. Well, it's a tech conference. Hacking, discussing source code and projects. Yeah. Very cool. Great surrounding. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what do you have in store for 30 hour day? Why don't you tell us what you have Oh, is this a 30 planned? hour, is it a 30 hour this day This is just talk? an interview. Oh. Huh. What do you have planned? Um, 30 hours. Okay. Live streaming. Can you give us any, No like, sleep. All for charity. <laughs> Can you give us a, a hint to like uh, anything exciting, any exciting announcements? People who Target might for be tomorrow. On, Target, Target for tomorrow, tomorrow is going to be our opening band. They're going to do an awesome job. We're going to have some interaction with the uh, KGW at the Square, uh, News at 7, which will be super fun. Morgan Sinkle has got a... Uh, a fantastic variety show planned for us, and and we're uh, currently in the plans to have one hell of a Portland slumber party going on overnight. We've also got DJs booked, and uh, dance lessons, and all sorts of fun things going on. You should join us. When's the variety show? The variety show is 10 o'clock Saturday the 3rd okay. of July, not of June, because if it was in June, we'd be in big trouble, wouldn't we? <laughs> and it's going to be in the square, right? The variety show in itself is in the square, correct. Awesome. On a stage on a stage in the square, Portland's living room. Hopefully it won't rain, but who knows? It's Portland. We're prepared for anything. You should be too. Bring a raincoat and a Leatherman tool, just in case you need one. I like to carry one in case I need one. Excellent. Yeah. So anything else in the works? Anything you can tell us about Strange of Live or Meme PDX or? Nope. How'd Meme PDX go? How'd you and Rick do? Me, uh, was Meme PDX good today? You and Meme Rick PDX was have a great time. Uh, Meme PDX was excellent today. It was fantastic. Rick and I, no, no, we did not. Oh, have, no. We didn't have a Rick today. We had a not Rick Trozzi today. Oh. Or wait, I'm sorry. It wasn't not Rick Trozzi. As the case maybe it was a not not Rick Trozzi. It just wasn't Rick Trozzi. It was Jason Glassby. Jason Glassby. Yeah. I recruited him. Wow. I called in the big guns. I said, hey, Jason. Jason Super Bowl Glassby. Jason Super Bowl Glassby. Yeah. Came on down. We, we did the show. How'd think, that go? How'd think, he do? I, I think it went well. Does he do well? I think he did well. We really? didn't have computers. It was low tech. We had note cards. I don't think that's the way Jason rolls. I think he just talks. He goes. Yeah, no, we needed note cards. Right. We had Excellent. to have them. The note cards were in, in very important. Yeah. But you no. think he did well, huh? I think, I, yeah, I was proud of him. He did good. You did good, Jason. Not that you're going to watch this. I think Jason's like me. He doesn't listen to or watch podcasts. That's funny. He's done several with us lately. <laughs> yes, he has, but it doesn't mean he has to watch them. When's he get, when does Jason Glassby get his own show? When Jason Glassby watches this to say, okay, Cammy, I would like my own show now. Ah. Oh, maybe we're making a secret announcement or something that we shouldn't. Uh-oh. See, he'll watch this because we're talking about him. No, he won't. I don't even think he watched the last oh, okay. episode of Me and Pete X that he was on. Oh, there you go. Jason, did you watch that episode? I don't think you did. Speaking of which, we, we need to upload it. <laughs> no, I meant the one before that. Okay. Well. Yeah. I think that was really entertaining and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that we should say goodbye to the boys and girls. I think so. I think we're running out of material. I think we ran out of material a while ago. Quite some time ago. Yes, exactly. Bye, guys. We'll see, see you later. later. Thanks for joining us.